praise God. Well, it's a great time to be alive, and this Saturday evening you might be joining us um, from different parts of Guyana, different parts of the world. You might be relaxing, you might be um, doing a bit of gardening, you might be driving. And so we want to welcome you and thank you again for um, the fact that you make every opportunity to view us every Saturday afternoon and when the program also is recorded on Wednesday. This is Choices. And, um, you know, in the height or the midst of all the hustle and bustle, um, you might have recognized that the Easter season, um, as quickly as it came, it has gone. And all the kite flying, the excitement that we would have had, um, they would have gone. But there is one significant feature about the Easter that we want to keep reminding ourselves about, we want to keep emphasizing, is the fact that we celebrate Easter because of the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because of the work he did. You know, the scripture tells us that he came into the world to die for sinners like you and I. And the fact is that he went to the cross, he was crucified, he was buried, and he has been resurrected. And he is seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for you and I, irrespective of who you are, where you reside, or what you consider of the Christian faith. So this evening, we want to share with you some important features about the resurrection. It's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a um, bedtime story, you know, where we see all sorts of things. It's not a Nancy story. But the fact is that Jesus Christ has risen. So we want to encourage you, call a family friend, call a member of your neighborhood or your community, and we are going to talk the resurrection story. God bless you. You know, the Apostle Paul says, if Christ had not been risen, he said, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Um, the central theme, our doctrine of Christianity is the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there would have been no church. The central theme is the resurrection. So, if you could destroy the, the resurrection, you destroy what Christ has built. He says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And I want to read a portion um, of words taken from a gentleman from England referred to as Lord Darling who was the Chief Justice of England. And he said, this is what he said, Christians are asked to take a very great deal on trust. The teachings, for example, and the miracles of Jesus. If we had to take all on trust, I, for one, should be skeptical. The crux of the problem, whether Jesus was or was not, what he proclaimed himself to be must surely depend on the truth or otherwise of, of the resurrection. On that greatest point, we are not merely asked to have faith in its favor as living truth. There exists, and this is what I want us to focus on now. He said, There exists such overwhelming evidence positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world would fail to bring in the verdict that a resurrection story is true. And so this man has a legal mind, Chief Justice of England, and he said any jury that is intelligent based upon the evidence that is positive and negative Remember, he was beaten, he, he was nailed to the cross, and then he did miracles and so on. So Darwin is saying that the evidence, whether positive or negative, whether circumstantial or not, he said any jury with sense would recognize that this thing has to be true. And later on, as we go on in the program, 
we may want to examine some of those evidence, evidences that the resurrection was real and the resurrection is true. And this legal mind made a significant input to negate any view that this might be a story that somebody has decided to make up just to make somebody feel happy or sad. Gentlemen. Two things I'd like us to make a comment on. The first one, Dr. Lee, you alluded to Christ died for our sins. They, they, we have a body of uh, knowledge, thinking, whatever, in our world today that suggests that people are not sinners. So this is a this idea of um, how do we classify people as sinners? Anybody can speak to that? Uh, because Christ died for your sin and mine, according to the scripture. Could anybody... If, if we are all not sinners, then we should be considered morally upright. Moral uprightness, according to the scriptures, cannot get us into the kingdom of God. There's no place for a moral upright person to be a recipient of eternal life. It is through the washing, the cleansing of the blood of Jesus that brings us into that place that we become recipients of eternal life. It begins with a confession and acknowledgement that indeed we are sinners in need of a savior and believing in our heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he came, he experienced a, a virgin birth, he lived a sinless life, he died, he rose again. And through him, we can experience everlasting life. Outside of that, we are all guilty. And so our place would be that of eternal damnation. You know, if we are not sinners, then we are not transgressors. And if we are not transgressors, there is no need for the law. Pack up the police force and send them home. No longer put fences around your home. You can drive wherever you wish and do whatever you care to do. The very nature of how life is set up, you know that we are transgressors. There is always a need to keep us in check. If we are honest with ourselves, we can we will say how horrible a sinner we are because we struggle to remain in line with the law. We, by nature, are transgressors. Therefore, if we are sinners, we need to be saved. And the scripture is very clear. Without the shedding of blood, there will be no forgiveness of sin. So it is even beyond our um, moral uprightness we have recognized that there is something innate in us that needs to be corrected and only the shedding of blood and jesus christ's blood is the supreme perfect final sacrifice for all sins now you know the apostle paul was clear he was speaking to this particular issue when he wrote first corinthians 15 now brothers and sisters I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on in which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in, vo in vain. For I have received, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised, and that the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. He was, did I say that he was buried, that he was raised, 
on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared, he then provided some evidence in terms of eyewitnesses. The point is, why did he die? Why did he have to die? He died to save us. And some think that um, this is an insult to modern man. I mean, we have been able to rid ourselves of this thing called sin. So did he die for just those who believe in him? You know, Jesus died for, he died for all. And I, I like to describe him as um, a universal man, the universal being in terms of what, in terms of what he did. And uh, the issue of sin, you know, I think we heard it. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, the nature of human beings, their nature is to be immoral. Their nature is to be evil. Their nature is to do wickedness. And, um, and no one, no one could say that these elements are not present in them. And that's why the Apostle Paul made it very clear. He said, even when I want to do good, evil is present. So the thing is, which one of the nature you allow to rule and what Christ did has allowed, given us the ability by the power of the Holy Ghost to, 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 to negate that nature that would want to come up. And uh, it should be very clear, not because you're in the church, you can sin. And, and, and I think that's important because sometimes people... You get the impression that once you're a church person, you are, you know, you have arrived. And that is why we need to be sanctified. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does that. Sanctification, which is instantaneous and progressive. It therefore means the progressive component tells you that no matter who you are, it is something that, is keep, um, that keeps working in you. So no one could say, that I've arrived and I've reached a point where, where I no longer sin up, but it is a constant thing that God has to be working in us. And so Jesus made that kind of passage for us when he said, when I leave, I will send you the comforter, the paraclete, the one who will come alongside us, the one who will empower us and give us the kind of um, power that we need to live this life in a holy, um, in a holy fashion. As the scripture is very clear, and he said, be holy as I am holy. So we, we are a work, um, a work in progress. And I think that is important, even as we speak on this subject. When you look at why or for whom Jesus came, um, Jesus came for mankind. You know, Dr. Thing said um, the, the universal, put in context of universal uh, man. He came for mankind, not for the animal kingdom, nor for the plant kingdom. And why I say that, the scripture reminds us um, that we were created in the image and the likeness of God. And because that relationship was broken, when man disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, it requires, as Genesis um, um, chapter 3 verse 15 um, tells us, um, concerning the, the, um, the, the fact that God had a plan in place for our redemption. So it was necessary for Jesus Christ to come and to die for our sin. So Bishop, there is no distinction in whom Jesus came for. Jesus came for the entire human race, not for the animals, not for the plants. So once you identify yourself as a human being, Jesus came and died for your sins, like mine. I want to, I want to take Jesus' statement directly from the book of John chapter 3 in answering that question. Uh, a Jewish rabbi, Nicodemus by name, came to him and was inquiring about the old subject of eternal life, how to be saved. In Jesus' response to him, he said in verse um, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the question is, did he come just for the righteous? He came for everyone. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's powerful to have and that kind of response to that question so that all of our viewers will know that they qualify. We all qualify to receive and to benefit from the re redemptive purposes of God. The second observation, um, a legal luminary from England was quoted Dr. Hudson quoted, and you heard what he said. I don't have the reference before me, but you heard what he said. The Apostle Paul, it is clear, did not set out to prove when he wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, he did not set out to prove the death of Christ. He did not set out to say, well, provide evidence because this was common knowledge. This was known by all that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, was crucified. And the overwhelming evidence, some of us, if we were to um, repeat some of the evidence um, on about the Roman crucifixion, we will have to change the rating of this program because it will definitely offend um, the sensitivities of some of our viewers. We are conscious. When you examine this instrument of capital punishment that the Romans were credited with invented. Uh, crucifixion. No human could have survived the barbaric uh, treatment and what was meted out by a soldier. They didn't have any standard that the man with the lash, for example, will only apply a certain number. It could go beyond the 39. It could go beyond, it depended a whole lot, very subjective. And, and the fact that they use leather thongs and they uh, ingeniously uh, platen sharp stones in between those tongues that when the lash was applied to the back, beginning from the shoulder of the prisoner to the area of the buttocks, it was bare. Whenever that lash was applied and, and withdrawn, it came back with the victim's flesh, parts of the flesh, lots of the blood. And I mean, this thing was very, very horrific. Um, they actually nailed him on the T part of the cross and then they they already had the vertical part in the ground you know it's amazing that the artists in our midst and, and, and the power of culture the west projected that Jesus was pierced in his in his hand, you know, all the paintings that we see there. Um, but and it would tell you that if he was pierced through the palm of his hand, once his weight on that cross, um, you know, once they hung him up there, it was gonna rip through. His body weight would have done that. So uh this point is perhaps just below the wrist. That point is where that five to seven inch spike was hammered in. 
and that supported the body. The suffering on the cross is not for the squeamish. And Christ suffered, disfigured, so that he could set mankind free. Uh, Reverend Sani, you said, without the remission, without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission. And the old practice of using animals to substitute for the transgression, interesting word, and the sins of humans. Now this one, this that system had to be done every year. But now the superior sacrifice, once and for all. And that's the reason why we can uh, understand uh, not only his suffering, but according to Jewish law, Jewish tradition, part of Friday, all day Saturday, part of Sunday, that uh, uh, amounted to three days. That was the Jewish um, practice. Part of a day was a day. So, um, Friday, Saturday, and on the third day, just as he said, this remarkable, astounding feat, supernatural is the word, occurred, that in 2020, that's 2,000 years ago, in 2024, Reverend Semple, we are still, books are still being written. Uh, whether he was on the cross or not, people, they, what do you call them? Uh, the people who uh, revisionists and conspiracy theorists, they continue to write. But they cannot Trump, the fact. Well, that's an interesting word I just used there. They, <laughs> they cannot destroy the fact that, that Jesus was resurrected. Praise God. And that, that you know, even in, as you went through the throes of letting us know how gruesome um, this crucifixion was there, Bishop, Blood flowed. Wow, that precious blood of Jesus that we be allowed to be applied over our lives, you know. And I want to introduce here the whole concept of communion. I know we're really delving too far, but his his body was broken and his blood was shed. And every time we partake of those emblems, we we do it in remembrance of him and the, the finished work on Calvary and what that finished work means to us. So it's it's amazing the relationship that we experience as we come close and we, we follow through by the grace of God. Amen. Taking us back, and I love the way Bishop brought this thing into four because we take things for granted. And before Jesus could have come off of his body, could have been taken off of that cross, there had to be evidence of his death and the piercing of his side produced blood and water, which confirmed that he was dead. They wrapped that body and they placed it in that tomb. Again, the conspiracy that they have that his body was sto stolen. Where is it hidden? 2000 years after we can't find that body. So what are we really saying? You know, the evidence is there. We went there. We went into that tomb and we found that place empty. He's alive. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, making intercession for all of us even now. And we want to give God glory for that. Well, technology has helped the, the world, um, archaeologists, um, scientists and all of that, to locate things that have been hidden um, for thousands of years. But um, I know um, efforts are being made to find or locate the body of Jesus. That will never, ever happen because he's risen and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us. And we can testify to that relationship 
because we talk to him and we can talk to him. You know, the scripture reminds us, you know, that when we pray, you know, we pray and he will hear us, he will answer us and he will show us great and mighty things. And that is the evidence that we have personally and that's the evidence we want to share with you that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he's alive. He is not here. He has risen. You know, that's a powerful portion of scripture. And what I love about the finished work of the cross is that it fulfilled testimony. It, it fulfilled the promises of God. It fulfilled the prophecies concerning the life of Jesus in accordance with Luke 24, 6 to 7. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. The, the cross, powerful symbol of our faith and our belief. And we thank God for the finished work of the cross, for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in that in that activity, in that, that occurrence, we have hope that because he died and he lives, we can live all so we can have eternal life. To God be the glory. We will continue examining this whole notion about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are quite aware that all kinds of theories have come and they've gone. Some said he didn't die, he swooned. Others said he revived and he was taken to India, for example. There is actually a theory that others says he, they hid him and he went to Egypt and he, he took a bride and raised a family. It is interesting to hear all the different we can examine those theories from the set of choices we want you to celebrate the resurrection of our lord jesus christ god bless you we'll see you next week we thank you for joining us on choices today remember you can join us at first assembly lnp durban street workmanville georgetown guyana for any of our special services I'm Celestia on behalf of the set reminding you that your whole life is the sum of your choices. God bless you.